Greetings, dear friends. I'm so glad to be with you, and I ask God to bless each one of you. May he protect you from danger and disease and deception. We have an enemy who is a thief and a destroyer and a liar, but he is God's enemy too, and God is fighting him for us. Well, let's begin our Bible study with prayer. Kind Father, we thank you for the Bible. It has been preserved and translated and published at the cost of many human lives, and so it is a precious book, but it's even more precious because it's your word. It was your Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible writers, and so it's the Holy Spirit whom we need with us right here and now to help us understand what they wrote. Will you please send him the spirit of truth to guide us into truth? In the name of Jesus, the word of God incarnate, amen. Well, today we consider the fifth commandment, the commandment with the built-in promise. Honor thy father and thy mother, that's the command, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And that's the promise. And I like the way the words sound. They just sound like something unrolling and getting longer and longer and longer. Well, if God makes a promise, you ought to be able to rely on his keeping it, right? Hebrews 10, 23 says, he is faithful who promised. But be honest now. Have you ever known of a person who obeyed the fifth commandment, who honored father and mother, and who did not live a long time? I have. There have been many people who have honored their mothers and fathers and who yet have died young, even as little children. What happened? Did God forget to keep his promise? I know that this online gathering is a gathering of God's friends. And if you are a friend of God, whenever someone suggests some kind of challenge against God's character, as I have just done, right away you want to come to the defense of your friend. And so you might already be thinking of this idea. Well, a person who keeps the fifth commandment may not live long in this mortal life, but there is eternal life in the hereafter. And that's when God will keep his promise that those who honor their father and their mother will live long upon the land which the Lord their God giveth them. And that's a good defense as far as it goes. But then couldn't this promise about long life be tacked onto any of the commandments? For example, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Or Thou shalt not steal, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. No, it's only the fifth commandment that has this promise. Why is this promise about long life? Why didn't God promise that if you honored your father and your mother, you would never have trouble, trouble with allergies, or you would have perfect pitch, or you would never have a bad hair day? Why was the promise about long life? Did God just think it up on a whim that day at Mount Sinai? Was he being arbitrary? Arbitrary, that is an important word. And in case any children ever listen to this lesson, I should explain the word arbitrary because children might not yet know that word. Boys and girls, if someone does something arbitrarily, he does it not for any cause, not for any reason, not for any purpose, but just because he feels like it on a whim. The scary thing about an arbitrary person is you never know what he's going to do. One day he might arbitrarily be generous and the next day he might arbitrarily be cruel. You cannot trust an arbitrary person and you cannot reason with an arbitrary person. And God has been accused of being arbitrary, of making unreasonable and unfair demands 
on his creatures just to test them. Here's what Ellen White wrote in an article entitled, The Character of God Revealed in Christ. Satan has sought to misrepresent the character of God. The creator has been presented as clothed with the attributes of the prince of evil himself as arbitrary, severe, and unforgiving. Satan has been very subtle in trying to make God look arbitrary. Remember how that old snake spoke to our mother Eve in the garden? He didn't come right out and say, God is an arbitrary person. No, he asked, has God really forbidden you to eat of any of the trees in the garden? Satan spoke as if he had heard that God had placed Adam and Eve in the middle of this garden with vineyards and orchards just full of fruit and food and then told them not to eat any of the food. And he was speaking as if he just wanted Eve to verify or clarify. And she did clarify. She answered the snake. Oh, no, snake, you've got it wrong. God hasn't forbidden us to eat from any of the trees except one tree, this one tree. And you know how the conversation went after that. Eve should never have entered into conversation with Satan. Even as pure-minded as she was, as intelligent as she was, she was no match for Satan. And God knew she was no match for Satan. That was exactly why God had forbidden her and Adam to eat from the tree where the snake was. Satan was not permitted to follow Adam and Eve all around the Garden of Eden, hounding them and nagging them and wearing them down. No, but he was given one place in the garden from which he could express his views. God allowed his enemy a platform because God is a believer in free speech. So that was one purpose God had in placing the tree in the garden. And God also had a purpose in the command he gave to Adam and Eve not to approach that tree, not to eat of its fruit. And that was to protect them from a very crafty liar. He didn't want them to meet up with Satan. So there was nothing arbitrary about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or about the command not to eat from it. And there's nothing arbitrary about the fifth commandment either. I'd like to show that what God is giving us in the fifth commandment is not an arbitrary rule with an arbitrary reward tacked onto it, but a description of a natural consequence of honoring mother and father. And its purpose is to benefit human beings. But before I do that, I'd like to make sure that we are thinking broadly about honoring father and mother. Jesus, remember, he said he had not come to destroy the law, but to fill it full of meaning. That's in Matthew 5. Remember, he taught us to think broadly rather than narrowly. He said, not only should we refrain from murdering people, we shouldn't even be angry with them. Remember how Jesus taught us that? Well, the fifth commandment says, honor thy father and thy mother. But is it only a person's biological father and mother who are to be honored? No, you can include a lot of people under thy father and thy mother. The Jews understood very well that father could mean grandfather or great-grandfather or many greats grandfather. They knew what Jesus meant when he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Even though Abraham had lived 2,000 years before, he could be called their father, and that made sense to them. So the fifth commandment is not only about our biological fathers and mothers, but also grandfathers, grandmothers, anyone who is older than we are. So are we all thinking broadly about the law? Okay, then let me try to show how long life is the natural result of honoring people who are older than we are. The key is to turn around and look behind us into the past. You see, we tend to think 
that thy days may be long means you will live a long time into the future. You will get to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. But there's another way of looking at that expression. Thy days may be long could mean your life will be extended into the past. We can look into the past, we human beings. We have memories, and histories. If you honor your father and mother, if you listen to them, if you take an interest in their lives, especially in those portions of their lives which took place before you came on the scene, well then, those portions of your lives become part of your life too. For example, I'm 69 years old, but my mother lived for 31 years before I was born. And insofar as I listen to her tell me about her life during those 31 years, anything and everything about her life, uh, the clothes she wear, the people she knew, what was going on in the world, her struggles, her failures, her victories, the lessons she learned, all of that as I honored her by valuing and assimilating what she shared with me, those 31 years of hers became mine too. Through my mother, God added 31 years to my life. And my grandmother lived for 29 years before my mother was born. So insofar as I honored my grandmother, those 29 years of hers became mine too. <clears throat> You see how it works. If you spend time, if you pay attention, if you love and honor the generations before yours, then those years in the past are added to your life and your days will be long. So do you see that the promise of long life is not just an arbitrary incentive that God tacked onto the fifth commandment. It's a natural consequence of honoring those who precede us. And to what purpose? Would God want us to honor our elders and make the years of their lives our own? Well, his purpose is our own good. We are human beings, and human beings are created to live in community with continuity across the generations. It's just the way we're made. We need the knowledge of our elders, and God knows we need it. As it says in Romans 2.15 in Peterson's message translation, God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. This need for continuity across the generations, not all creatures on earth have it. For example, sea turtles. Have you thought about sea turtles lately? A mother sea turtle comes up onto the beach, digs a hole in the sand, lays her eggs in the hole, covers them with sand, and then goes back into the sea. The sun incubates her eggs. She never sees them hatch. The little baby sea turtles, they're so cute. I don't know if you've seen pictures of them. They, they make their way back into the sea and they are on their own. They never hear their mother tell them stories about when she was a little sea turtle. They don't learn from her how to be good sea turtles. And that seems to be just fine for sea turtles. God provides everything they need to be happy, well-adjusted sea turtles <laughs> without any connection at all between the generations. So God did not command sea turtles to honor their fathers and their mothers. But you and I, dear friends, are not sea turtles. We are human beings. And we need the connections of community in order to be happy, healthy human beings. That's why God commanded us to honor the previous generations. So now I'd like to give you an example of honoring previous generations by honoring the memory of a woman who died before I was born, my great great aunt, Anna Mary Jensen Woodbury. <laughs> she never had any children of her own, so I feel it's my duty and my delight and my privilege to rise up and call her blessed. Almost everything I know about Aunt Anna, I learned from my mother. 
my mother spoke often and affectionately of Aunt Anna, and she gave me some photos and uh, a payment statement and a postcard and some books that were Aunt Anna's. This is a beautiful old edition of a book called Steps to Christ, and it's a wonderful thing to hold in your hands a book that was held in the hands and read by someone who was born 160 years ago. And Aunt Anna was an underliner. Maybe some of you are underliners too. She underlined very lightly in pencil. And wherever I see a passage that she underlined, I pay special attention to that because I know it must have been important to Aunt Anna. I sort of take it as a message from her to me, even though she never knew me. The loveliness of the character of Christ will be seen in his followers. We love because he first loved us. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. Well, let me try to trace the way that Aunt Anna's sweet influence refined and shined on me, even though I never knew her. Let's see if I can share my screen. Is it happening? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, here are my Aunt Anna's parents, the Jensens. They lived in Denmark and in 1861 was when they had Aunt Anna. They had a little girl and named her Anna. And before she got to be too grown up, they all emigrated. They moved from Denmark to the United States. And it was in the United States that they joined the young Seventh-day Adventist movement. This is Aunt Anna, my great, great aunt. She became a Bible worker and her pay was $5 a week. <laughs> And for a time, she worked on a special project to reach Black Americans with the gospel and to improve their lives through education. A riverboat called the Morning Star was built up in Michigan and sailed down the Mississippi to Vicksburg, Mississippi. And that's where Aunt Anna worked. She taught Bible classes to women who had been slaves. Here is Aunt Anna's younger brother, Peter, and he was my great grandfather. And he married this lady, my great grandmother. Her name was Alice. Peter and Alice had a little girl, Dina, and she was my grandma. But when Dina was only three years old, her mother, Alice, died of tuberculosis. A lot of people got tuberculosis back then. And a few years later, her father also died. So there was poor little Dina, an orphan. My great, great aunt Anna was not only a teacher, but also an able speaker. And she preached the sermon at her brother's funeral. And then Aunt Anna took little Dina into her home and was like a mother to her. Aunt Anna was quite strict, but she and Dina were always very fond of each other. And when Aunt Anna was middle-aged, 46, she got married, married a nice man named Mr. Woodbury, and they lived in this big old house in Wisconsin, up in the north of the United States. Well, meanwhile, a young fellow named Clarence Cole had joined the Adventist church. That's my grandpa. He had been working in a lumber camp, um, not with a saw. He was not a sawyer. His job was to work with the horses who hauled the logs. But his pastor and his pastor's wife thought that the coarse associations of a lumber camp made it no place for a Christian boy and they wanted to get Clarence out of the lumber camp. They wanted to find some place else for him to work and to stay. And they found a job for him at that big old house in Wisconsin. 
working for Aunt Anna and her husband. Well, that's where Clarence met Dina. You know, the little girl whose parents had died. She was almost the same age as Clarence and they fell in love and got married. I know that in India, people get married and then fall in love. And I think that is so beautiful and romantic. Um, but in the States, it's done the other way around. People fall in love and get married. So Clarence and Dina fell in love and got married and went to South Africa as missionaries. And there they had a little girl named Violet. And that was my mother. That's my mother, Violet, with that huge hair bow in her hair, big ribbon. And after the family returned to the United States, they often had visits with Aunt Anna. When Aunt Anna was old and a widow, she lived with them. And I think that's so fine, the way generations help each other during different phases of life. When Dina was young and needed a home, Aunt Anna gave her a home. And when Aunt Anna was old and needed a home, her niece Dina gave her a home. Well, my mother told me that her great aunt Anna was a very humble and very generous woman. Whenever there was a need for funds for gospel work, aunt Anna would find some money to give. And she was the one, my mother told me, who got my mother her very first store-bought dress. Well, one day, aunt Anna was sitting in her room reading her Bible. Her door was open. My mother walked past and Aunt Anna called her, Violet, come here, come and look at this. She pointed to her Bible and read from Revelation 5, 11. And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Aunt Anna had read that verse many times before, but she, in her old age, was still excited to read it again. And she shared that excitement with my mother. And many times my mother shared that excitement with me when she repeated this memory of hers. She told me that Aunt Anna said, Violet, can you imagine how many angels that is? Well, Aunt Anna died not long after that nine years before I was born. But I'm confident that someday I will meet her together with my mother and my grandmother and an innumerable host of others. We will cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. That imagery from Revelation is highly symbolic, I'm sure. I, I don't know if the redeemed will actually be wearing bands of metal on their heads. The crown represents eternal life, a gift from Jesus. The crown represents our participation in his life of self-sacrificing love. But permit me to play with this lovely imagery. I imagine that we're in the New Jerusalem and we've all cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. Can you imagine what a glittering, Mount Everest of crowns that would make. And I, I go to this mountain of crowns and manage to find and pluck out Aunt Anna's crown. I know this is impossible by earthly realities, but we're imagining and we have good imaginations, right? So I find Aunt Anna's crown and I pull it out from the pile because I want to look at it. I want to see the stars in it that stand for the people whose lives Aunt Anna touched for the sake of God's kingdom. I find the star that stands for my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncles, my mother, my sister. And there's even a teeny tiny little star that stands for me. I will be a star in the crown of my Aunt Anna, even though she and I never met. Isn't that wonderful? I love and serve the Lord because my mother taught me to love and serve the Lord because her mother taught her to love and serve the Lord because her mother and her Aunt Anna taught her to love and serve the Lord because her mother taught her to love and serve the Lord. You see how it goes back and back. And as I trace God's goodness back through the generations, 
my life is lengthening and lengthening into the past. God is keeping his promise to me. He is not, as Satan insinuated to Eve, an arbitrary person. No, he loves us too much and he respects us too much to make unreasonable demands of us or to tack arbitrary rewards onto his commands. Both his requirements and his rewards make good sense. Long life is the result of honoring previous generations and the resulting cohesiveness among the generations is something that we human beings need for health and happiness. My days are long upon this land and I calculate that God has already given me at least 190 years. That's how old I am. Well, dear friends, I hope that it will be so with you too. Just go and find somebody older than you. For example, your mother or your father. But it could be anybody who's older than you. And love and honor that person. Ask questions and listen carefully. Or you could learn about a person from a previous generation like Aunt Anna, who has already died. Or let's take the fifth commandment in its broadest sense. In its very broadest sense, the fifth commandment is a command to pay attention in history class, to value old books and old music and old works of art. You know, it's my understanding that in India, old age and antiquity are esteemed more highly than they are in the United States. Here in the West, many people think that their generation is the smartest and they regard previous generations and their products with scorn. I have even heard Christians speak as if in the whole history of humankind, they are the very first ones whom God has been able to reach with his grace. The fifth commandment teaches us better, don't you think? And God will show us many ways to keep the fifth commandment, to honor father and mother. And as we obey, as we look back in humility and gratitude, we will find our days lengthening and our community strengthening. For God's commandments are fair and reasonable and for our best good and his promises are trustworthy. Well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, the more we learn about your generous, reasonable ways, the more we love you. We are just latecomers. We are grateful for all those who have come before us into your kingdom. And we just are grateful that we can add our praise to the praise of those who have gone before us. You are worthy, O oh God, of our praise and our adoration and our trust and our obedience. Alleluia forever and ever. Amen.